Okay, third time's the charm. The first two time I recorded this without sound. Hello guys, welcome to the Self Starters. Um, different format today. I have literally just flown in from the UK a few hours ago. So yeah, I think I'm working on two or three hours of sleep. But rest assured, I ate every single thing put in front of me on that plane. Because even if it's peanuts, I paid for it. Um, yeah, I was in the UK for a few weeks. Surprise for anyone who doesn't know, me and my fiance are immigrating to the UK for a couple of years. So she was there for work. I was there on a recon mission looking for a house. I'm happy to announce that um, we are now or soon to be the proud tenants of a matchbox nowhere near the center of London but it does have four very pretty walls and a very nice door there is a blade of grass um, outside which does constitute a garden in London apparently so yeah come back to to level six load stage six load shedding what a wow amazing um, we're reaching new heights at least with stage six load shedding we will save some money uh, because we are spending a bit more with petrol now being at 337,000 rand a liter good lord almost the same price as ink can you believe it um you know it's exciting times i must say even though i took a shower in the dark just a moment ago um it's quite nice to do it in my palatial two bedroom two bathroom apartment um you know won't, won't be enjoying space for much longer that being said if anyone who lives in midrand and no longer can afford paying for petrol to get into santon wants a house in craigall park let me know please but anyway i've digressed a whole lot just wanted to fill you in on on what i've been up to um today on the podcast i have dr anesum Vijo. A good friend of mine from Survivor South Africa, if any of you watch that. Um, but what a great story. I think she has had a, a journey from high school through to university that would make any Indian parent proud to become a doctor. Wow, we. And at that point, things go a bit off kilter because soon after qualifying, she decided that, you know what? This doctor thing is not for me. Collectively, all Indian parents faint. Um, and she decided to become a yogi. I know, it's quite it's quite a juxtaposition. Um, but I have a lot of admiration for her steeliness and her ability to understand that it's not all about the money and the status. It's about happiness. And with that pursuit for her passion, she has turned it into a massively successful business. Not just as a yogi but also with her business called The Nest Space, which is a, a wellness center here in Johannesburg. Um, it's doing amazing things in, in the yoga space and making it a more inclusive space for, for people of color specifically. So I wanted to rack her brains as to why someone would study medicine to leave it all behind. Needless to say, she answers those questions and also teaches me a whole lot about how she started a business without much of an understanding, but with, uh, I guess, a full belly of passion and Google. It's amazing how often Google comes to an entrepreneur's fingertips. I hope you enjoy and um, if you're tuning in for the first time, this is The Self Starters, a place where we learn how to turn our ideas into successful action. And because you're listening, you have no excuse not to get started on your idea right this very moment, this very moment right now, unless you want to listen to Dr. Anesu first. But Anesu, you're the, the founder and co-owner of The Nest Space, you know, and that's an inclusive and wellness center. You're, it offers yoga therapy, there's a zero waste grocer, there's a vegan restaurant. You're also a 700 hour yoga teacher. Now that is a lot for one person to look after. And I'm very curious to understand how you really manage such a multifaceted business. But before that, uh, I want to dig into a bit that you were a medical doctor before you were such a prolific businesswoman. Um, you practiced for a year and then went in a completely different direction. Um, why did you leave medicine behind you? Why did you study it? And how did you end up where you are today? And I know that's, that's basically going to be the entire podcast, but maybe yeah. let's start at the beginning. Um, why did you study medicine? 
And how did you end up at this point or how did you end up leaving medicine? Yeah. So, I mean, I grew up in Zimbabwe. My dad's a doctor and um, being a doctor is kind of like a hereditary disease. Like it kind of goes through the family, <laughs> like it's genetic, you know? So my dad's family are full of medics. Um, his brothers are doctors. I have aunts who are nurses or did public health. And so health was always something that I would hear stories about. You know, my dad would come home after work, talk about an interesting patient that he had or a procedure that he did. And I always was quite intrigued by that. I remember being young and I thought I was going to become a vet because I loved animals. And then I watched the vet shows on National Geographic and I was like, no, I'm definitely not going to do that. <laughs> so let me work on people. Um, and that was high school. I was quite sure that medicine was what I wanted to do because I loved bio. I loved the human body. I was super intrigued by how it all worked and how this incredible machine that we have just kind of automatically takes us through life. And so that's what I decided to study. And I was really passionate about it. And even during med school, I loved medicine. I loved studying. I loved the work that we were doing, working with patients when we were doing our practical hours. So at that point, there was no doubt in my hmm. mind that I was on the right track. And then I was kind of doing yoga during med school just to ease my stress. You know, I'm quite a competitive person. You'll know that from Survivor. <laughs> <laughs> so medicine is quite competitive. You know, med school, everybody's trying to one-up each other. It's quite academic. And I needed something where I didn't need to compete. I wasn't going to be comparing myself to other people. And I had done yoga with my mom when I was like five or six growing up. She took me mm. with her to some of her yoga classes. So I knew what yoga was and I got back into it in my 20s. And it really helped me to cope with med school. But I thought it was just a hobby, just something that was for me, something that I love to do. And then in my final year of medicine, I really wanted to go deeper into yoga. So I did a yoga teacher training, but also thinking that maybe I would just I don't know where I thought I'd have the time to teach <laughs> yoga and be a doctor, but I kind of <laughs> thought I'd be able to make both both worlds work. Um, and then I became a doctor and it was weird. I enjoyed the work, right? I enjoyed working with patients, finding diagnoses, helping people, healing people. But when I looked at my quality of life and also what my life trajectory would look like, a lot of my seniors and the people that were supposed to be my role models were divorced. They'd missed out on all of their children's milestones. Mm. They were depressed. They were anxious, especially because in medicine, there's kind of this push for everybody to specialize. So you start off having a really open, broad scope of medicine, which is quite interesting because one day you're delivering a baby in internship and then the next day you're operating on the heart, which I mm. loved. You know, I'm quite keen on doing lots of different things, but you're kind of encouraged the more you go along to specialize and hone in on one thing. And what ends up happening is you do the same procedures, you're working with the same team every day, you're seeing the same illnesses and diseases. And so a lot of my senior colleagues were uninspired, yeah. feeling a bit hopeless, helpless, and, and having their, their personal lives just crumbling around them. And so I was seeing this and then at the same time, experiencing it myself, like, you know, I didn't have time to see my friends. My sleep was a complete wreck. I wasn't eating right. And it just wasn't giving me what I wanted from my work. I think I always felt like I wanted to feel happy and fulfilled in my work. And I was getting the fulfillment, but the joy was like, it was just dripping out. And so I stuck with it because I thought, okay, you know, these are just the first Two years, this is what happens. It's kind of part of the tradition. You know, it's like a hazing of medicine. <laughs> um, so I thought, okay, I'll just grit, grip my teeth and get through it. But it just didn't get any better. And I, I'd always wanted to be a surgeon and work with kids. So I was like holding off for, mm. you know, my surgical experience and pediatric experience. And then I got there and I loved it. I loved the work, but I just couldn't see myself doing it. I, I I didn't have what, what it took, I guess, to, to, to do clinical medicine. So I thought, okay, maybe I'm just burnt out, you know, mental health stuff. Let me take a year off. We were allowed to do that. And I worked in corporate for some time, still within health. So trying to fuse technology and health together. 
um, and use those solutions for rural mm. communities, which is really intriguing. But the corporate world is something else too. You know, mm. I was working for this big tech company and most, even though we were trying, our projects were quite human centered, it was still definitely profit over people. And then, you know, you walk into your corporate building and you sit in the cafe near the entrance and people are almost like zombies walking in and out of work. Like they know to say hello to the reception desk, hello to the people at the cafe. It's like a routine. And I just, I, I thought I'm not this conveyor belt of living. Like, I, mm. I, I, again, I also couldn't do it. But the more things I did and was like ruling out, it was like, okay, so medicine, nope, corporate, nope. So like, <laughs> what left? are the options up there? Yeah, what's left? What is there to do? And then I thought, well, maybe my issue is that I'm, my time and the work that I'm doing is being determined by somebody else. So maybe the answer is not so much what I'm doing, but how I'm working and maybe working for myself will be the better option. So I used my time in corporate, you know, it was a nine to five, which was like ample time for me. <laughs> I was used to working nine till nine. So now I had my evenings, my weekends. And I started thinking about, you know, if I was to build my life, my work life, what would that look like? All the way down to when would I wake up in the start of the day? What sort of conversations would I want to have? Who would I be working with? What would my work environment be like? And the more and more I started asking myself those questions, the more yoga and, and the alternative side of healing came up because healing and interacting with people was always something that I wanted to do. Mm. But it also allowed me to work in a beautiful environment. And that's when I started thinking about opening up a wellness center. And I had been doing yoga for a while um, at that point. And one of the things that I always experienced was going into a yoga studio and being the only person of color. And then you're like the, the representative, right? You're like the tribute for all brown people in the yoga studio. Everybody's looking at you. And I never felt safe or relaxed enough to really go deep into my practice. So I thought that I would just create that space for myself, create a space where other brown people would come, where queer people would come, people with disabilities, people with body sizes or shapes that usually weren't seen as fit or flexible or acceptable. And that's essentially where the idea for the Nest Space was born. And I saved my corporate salary as much as I could. And eventually I had saved up enough. I started the business. But then I realized that the nine to five just was, was too much time away from my business. So I started looking again for another career. Uh, I needed something part time. I didn't want something too serious because I wanted all of my mental space and energy to go into the business. And at that time, a, a fellow yoga teacher friend of mine was working at a preschool and she was looking for a teaching assistant. And I was like, hey, that sounds pretty cool. You know, I liked working with kids. I always thought I'd go into pediatrics anyway. So I applied. I became a preschool teaching assistant and was like, okay, I wonder what my med school colleagues are thinking about me now. Um, but the yeah, most overqualified my... teaching assistant exactly. the world has ever seen. <laughs> the parents loved it. They were like, okay. We we're happy, even if it was their kid's first day at school. They were like, there's a doctor here. She's fine. She knows exactly what to do. So they loved it. I loved it. I was jumping on the trampoline and finger painting and playing with Play-Doh all day. And um, yeah, six months in, I, I became a fully fledged teacher. I had my own class and then ended up like managing a whole section of the preschool um, and, and really could see myself continuing on, mm. you know, on that track. But by that point, the business had grown and the nest space was evolving. I'd met my business partner by then. We went from being just a yoga studio to the wellness center, having a little cafe, having a store, having our therapy rooms. And by that time I'd saved up enough to, to just go into it full time. Mm. Um, and yeah, I've been doing that since 2018 now. Oh, it's been a crazy ride. It's <laughs> like some days are like preschool. Some days are like medicine. Some days are like corporate, you know, and it, it's just interesting to see how there's been no time wasted throughout the whole experience from when I graduated from med school. Every experience that I've had has really helped me to do what I do today. Mm. Yeah. And I've, I, I, I love the journey and I love, I think one thing that's clear as you talk is just the, the real intent and, and intention behind every action you've taken. 
and and it's it's great to hear and i think it it, it really does speak to your background i can imagine how you became a doctor because there's you know you're very methodical in your process and I, I would want nothing less from from anyone looking after my health um but let's let's go back to when you you had just come up with the idea for for the nest space what's what's lovely to hear and what we hear a lot on the podcast is people generally create something to fill a void or solve a problem that they have you've almost looked at what is the type of life that i would want and i want to build a business that will give me that life which is which is not a take we've heard before but i love that um i think it takes a real level of guts and self belief to be able to say this is the life i want i'm going to build something successful to give me that i wish i had that courage i, I truly do now yeah, well, i'm sure the fear is there the fear well, is definitely there right and that's the question i have what was what was your what were you was your thinking in that time and and also the thinking of the people around you because i'm sure a lot of people were like you're going to do what <laughs> really th this i mean we've we, we've already watched you be you know be a be, be a preschool teacher for a bit or not even a preschool teacher an assistant to a preschool teacher for a bit the madness must end but you know it it clearly was methodical and well thought out maybe talk to me about you know how how that was received and you, the thinking that went into creating the idea for the nest space yeah i mean one of the amazing things that i think this journey has been for me is it's it's been a journey of of healing and and self introspection so i've always been like an achiever that you know when i was growing up in high school and even in uni the way that i would feel worthy or the way that i would feel like i was growing was by achieving things mm. right getting this trophy getting that certificate getting scholarship getting the graduate program all of those things started to define my self-worth and then what started to happen was i reached the destination that i was always searching for which was becoming a doctor i was good at it you know my patients were doing pretty well i was respected in my team but then i didn't have that like ah oh, mama i made it i've arrived i didn't have that feeling it was like okay i'm here but this is not where i thought I would be. Mm. And then it started sending me on this, you know, this question of okay, if this is how I've defined my life, you know, that's not generally how life goes. Um in high school and uni there are prizes that you can win, that you know, you can play sports, you know, maths olympiad whatever it is. But the older you get, the more the more soft stuff becomes your achievements, having a family, you know, um having really meaningful friendships, being happy and at peace in your life and those don't come with certificates or medals at all and so it it really made me start to question what i was defining myself by and i think that's what helped me make that shift from medicine into whatever followed because i realized i could go chasing for those titles i could become a surgeon and then after a surgeon become a neurosurgeon and then after a neurosurgeon become a neuropediatric surgeon and then a professor but again i'd still be chasing mm. all of those titles right and at the same time based on what i was seeing be lacking a family be lacking a peaceful home environment so i think i i it really took me looking into myself and and changing my perspective of what success looked like and realizing that success for me at least looked like me being at peace and being fulfilled by the work that i was doing but really enjoying it for me to overcome the fears that came with you know making that leap and i think once you achieve your ultimate goal and you realize that happiness isn't there it's kind of like a wacky experiment to figure out what is because then it's like okay i've done this big thing like i might as well give myself free reign to explore what other things are out there that i've never even thought of being yeah. a possible option for me in terms of career that's you know and and how do you deal or do you ever have the the feeling of when you you bump across a, an old med school friend and and they're like yeah i'm about to become a super specialist in x y and z do you ever sit back and think like keepers i wonder what what if and like what would have happened if i'd carried on and you feel this pang of like oh maybe i should go back or is it a case of when you've gone through this process it's it's very easy to leave it behind and the reason why i asked that is i'm sure there are lots of people 
on that cusp of wanting to transition out and do something else, but they can't help but compare themselves to their colleagues. And if you're competitive like you and I, the natural question you'll ask yourself next is, but I'm, I feel like I'm a better, I don't know, doctor, accountant or whatever than the person next to me. And it's going to irk me to see how far they could get and I've left it behind to do something else. Yeah, that's such a good question. I think you're right. Like that competitive nature definitely sneaks in there. But I, I thought about it so deeply. Like, mm. you know, it wasn't a once off kind of wake up in the middle of the night. Aha, you know, this is what it is <laughs> I want to do. I, I really thought it through. And and I'm also the type of person who believes that like there's no there's never a dead end, right? Once you make one decision, it doesn't mean you can't go back there. So when I see my friends and things, I've never experienced regret, which I think is is a wonderful thing, a blessing in its own right. You know, I definitely wonder like, okay, so, you know, this is, this is what your life looks like. This is where you're living. This is what your relationships look like. What would mine look like? You know, that, that thought process definitely happens, but because I know I could go back, um, it's never, it's never a pang of, oh, mm. I wish I should have. It's like, okay. So you're enjoying, you know, the car that they're driving and the house that they're living in. Okay, Nessu, so does that mean that you want to go back now? Like, and and every single time the answer is like, absolutely no way. It's like, there's not a chance that I would, I would want to go back. And I feel, yeah, really, really well rooted in the decision that I made, which is really great. And so let's let's get back to, to the Nest space. So when you started it, it was initially just a yoga studio. That's right, yeah. Did you already have the plans for what it would become? Or was it more a case of it was a natural growth into that? It's so crazy. I have a note that I wrote while I was in corporate of everything that I wanted the nest to be. And I actually saw it more of like a school, a yoga school, Mm. which is crazy because that's what it's become now post-COVID. It's like an online school. But um, I never thought... I thought about having a little cafe restaurant, but I thought I'd be in like my fifties when that happened. You know, I, I, it, for some reason, it just felt like that was way off, mm. way down the line. And so yes and no, I kind of, in this note that I wrote, I looked at it the other day, I mentioned it being a, a, a yoga studio. We would do yoga teacher trainings, short courses on different things of yoga. I kind of imagine like this old vintage house, you know, with a garden and people filtering in, staying, incense, you know, (laughs) mystical music in the background, (laughs) the whole hippie vibe. Um, So I definitely saw it being more than just a yoga studio, but it definitely took my business partner coming on board um, to kind of be that catalyst for us to change and us to evolve because I was able to manage the yoga studio on my own. And so when she came on board, it was like, okay, there's this whole other person uh, with all of this energy, all of this creative power. And we have this weird thing of us coming together, which it's like, I have what I do. She has what she does. So that's two parts. But when we come together, there's like a third part that like magically appears. And so I think that was really the catalyst for us growing into something more. And she had always wanted to have a cafe and restaurant, but also thought that it was going to be decades later. Mm. So it, it's kind of transformed into what it is today. But um, the backbone, I think like our why and our purpose has always remained the same. We are really about wellness, but letting African people know, and by African, I mean people living on the African continent, let Africans know that this is, these are our practices, you know, Mm. like if you go to my grand's house in Zimbabwe, all of her veggies are organic, her chickens are free range, like, you know what I mean? (laughs) These, these new age, you know, kind of eco conscious terms are the way that our ancestors have been living forever. Zero waste, get a Tupperware, you know, (laughs) use, use those orange sacks as a scrub or make them into a ball. That's what our people are all about. So that stayed the same. This concept that it's not so much introducing yoga as a new concept or introducing veganism or introducing, you know, um, zero waste eco living as a new concept to our community. It's more about reminding them that this is a way of life that our people have been living for decades, Mm -hmm. uh, not even decades, centuries. 
And I think that's that's remained the same while the business itself and how it's happened has kind of changed as we've gone along. And and talk to me about uh, your business partner, Vanessa. Right? It's how, how does one relinquish a bit of, I guess, their baby? And yeah, I think it's yeah. it's it's it's, imp- it's an important question because sometimes you 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 need a partner not not from a, a perspective of it's too much for someone to handle, but it's because it's a different way of thinking. You know that it, it improves your dynamic. It actually makes it more enjoyable and less stressful for you to run this this business. Uh, something that's quite daunting, but it's hard to find the right person. So how, how did uh, you how did you and Vanessa come together? And and what was it like in the early days? Were, was there more apprehension, or were you excited about you know almost giving up a part of this business you had started? Yeah. I mean, when I first started the new space, I always imagined that it would just be me mm. um, leading the business. I never imagined that I would have a business partner. And then as the business progressed as a yoga studio, I realized that my strengths are to start things up. So I'm generally, I have the vision and I get super excited by bringing the vision to reality. And then I'm like, okay, so we've done this now. Like, And then I'm on to the next vision, right? Yeah. Uh, totally but you that. need for a business, you kind of need something to sustain it. Yes, you can constantly keep growing and new ideas are important, but you do need almost a container to make it sustainable. And I got to this point where we were doing fine, but we weren't really growing. Our clientele were exactly the same. It was mainly my yoga community who knew me that were coming, but I just knew it could be so much more. And my friends from uni kept telling me about this other brown yogi who also had dreadlocks, who also was running a little yoga studio in Linden. And at first I was like, yeah, yeah, you know, just because she has dreadlocks and this yoga doesn't mean I'm going to be best friends. Like, it's not how this works, you know? So I put off meeting her for like probably over six months and she was getting the same story. Also, our names are similar. You know, it's Anesu and Vanessa. So I was like, this is just like there's no yeah. way this is going to work out so i agreed to eventually meet her for coffee she was involved with branding events that kind of stuff so i thought okay maybe what i need is a little branding workshop to really cement what the business is and she can help me with that and then i'll be on my way and so we scheduled like an hour's coffee um and we ended up meeting and chatting for about six hours that sure. afternoon and every single thing that we spoke about, we were exactly the same. It, it was like not meeting myself, but kind of like that, like meeting someone who had been on exactly the same journey as me, but just in, in different places. Mm. Um, so I met with her and I remember coming home to Fez after my partner Fez. And I was telling him about the meeting and I said, you know, I think I'm going to offer her 50% of the business. And he was like, what are you talking about? You just (laughs) met this person. Like you spent all of this time building this thing, blood, sweat and tears. How do you know that you can trust her? And I said, I I don't know what it is, but I just feel like that's what's meant to happen. Like I just feel it. And so he said, no, just sit with it, you know, take your time with it. And so I did. And then we met again and it was exactly the same feeling. And, um, it's funny, like after after bringing Vanessa on board, when we talk about, you know, getting someone to manage the studio or getting someone to do our admin, then the control freak in me is like, oh my gosh, I definitely don't want to relinquish control. I want to mm. keep it all to myself. I don't want to delegate. But with her specifically, I didn't have those feelings. I felt like it was exactly what I needed, what the business needed to succeed. So again took another leap of faith and was like listen you know do you do you want to be my business partner and she was like hell yes let's do this um and it was like second nature um when it when it began we we, she had all of the strengths that were weaknesses of mine and vice versa we had fun together we were inspired together whenever i was fearful she was confident whenever she was fearful i was mm. confident and it's it's worked amazingly ever since and it, it it's it's a funny thing because you know we do so many interviews um for the nest space 
And we, we often introduce ourselves as co-founders of the Nest space, even though I had begun it and she came on afterwards, because I think the Nest really became what it is today mm. when she came on board. That's lovely. Um, yeah, it's been an amazing thing. And also, like you say, I'm, I grew up as an only child, you know, I'm a bit of a controller. And I think I needed to learn the lesson of like, sometimes you need somebody's help in order to reach your full potential. It's, it's not about ownership, ego, you know, having your name there. Um, it's more about what the business needs. And that's that's what's made us both much more successful than if we had gone on our own and competed against one another. And if you could articulate, you know, the 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 key things someone should should look out for in in a scenario like that, because um, it, it's it's quite funny how, how often it's it seems to happen that someone meets with with who will become their future business partner and they just click and it's not a thing of like let me go do my due diligence let me go and check um, this person's criminal record. It's like, no, the, I, 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 I vibe with this person. I, I, they get what I'm trying to say. I get what they're trying to say. I think, you know, there's something here. Let's go with it. Whereas for me, sitting in corporate yeah. most of my life, I'm like, where's the due diligence? Surely you need to yeah. do X, Y, and Z, right? It's like, it, it almost feels it's easier to find a business partner than it is to to be hired into a company to be an employee. That's almost. so true. That, and, and I find that hilarious. But I, I think there's something in that. So it's you know, like what what is it that that almost you are looking for? If, have you reflected back and thought, you know, it was Vanessa's, uh, her, it was her personality, it was her drive, it was her vision. What 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 are the key things that almost need to align for you to almost just pick someone and be like, you're going to be my business partner. I definitely think getting the fact that we were in similar social circles. So, but I also went to UCT. She was a couple of years ahead of me and on upper campus. I was on mid campus, which is like a silo and bubble mm -hmm. in its own right. So we had a lot of common and mutual friends. And so even though I didn't know her, there was a lot of security in the fact that we were friends with the same people. All of my friends had really good things to say about her. They were close knit. I think if she was a complete stranger, I probably would have been like, hmm, okay, not too sure, <laughs> yeah. you know, if we're vibing here. But that I, I felt like my friends were almost like a reference for who she was as a person. Also, the fact that she was doing it herself. So she had started her own little yoga studio in Linden at the time. Um, and that also gave me a lot of solace because it, it made me feel like she could understand the challenges that I had gone through. You know, she had started it herself. She would had to find clients. Um, so that also made me feel comfortable. But you're right, hey, a lot of it was personality. And I think if I had met someone who was like me, like in terms of personality, in terms of the way that they phrase things, I think that would have definitely turned me off. You know, it was, <laughs> she was so different in, even in her goals, even though the end point was the same, her reason for why she wanted to do it, why she was doing the things were slightly different to um, what I was doing. And we had different strengths. Um, so all of those things really made me feel like it was the right decision but also I'm a bit of a hippie, you know, and I believe in <laughs> synchronicity and law of attraction mm. and all of those things and, and my intuition. And that was a big part of it. Like I, it was inexplicable. I was telling my parents, I was telling Fez and I said, I, I can't, I can tell you that my friends know her, that she's done this before, that we have the same strengths, but really the main reason is I just feel like this is the right thing to do. Um, and this is what I'm supposed to do. Uh, and so I, I kind of went with it. And I, I'm, I'm not lost for words, but I, I, I really resonate with that. And it's, I think it's, it's something that's so important for, for me to learn and for other people to learn. It's just that there's, there's no right or wrong answer. It's when it comes to your business and your baby, it really is how you feel about it and whether you trust your intuition. And, and that's what a lot of being an SME is. It's, it's trusting your intuition. It's not being able to get all the answers. It's impossible to get all the answers, but it's about understanding the reason behind why you're doing things and being able to, to trust your intuition and let go. Um, yeah. And I think for someone like me, the letting go is, is the hardest part. I mean, and there's also... 
Yeah, yeah. go for it. Um, there's also that, you know, again, I'm sure you and I are quite similar in this failure for me, especially because of medicine. Like if you fail, someone could die. You know, yeah. if you do something wrong, if you make a mistake or a misstep, they're life-threatening consequences. Whereas I think with a business, especially your first one, you kind of need to acknowledge that the mistakes are part of the success yeah. story, right? So even if this hadn't worked out with Vanessa, I was very aware that, okay, you know, if it didn't, I would have to accept it, deal with those consequences and start again. And I think that's the really wonderful thing about owning your own business is it's not do or die in terms yeah. of making mistakes. Um, and that's quite a, 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 like a weird thing to come to terms with of not being afraid. I wouldn't even say of failure because I think I'm definitely still fearful of failure. I don't want to fail. <laughs> um, but that thing of not seeing mistakes as like doom and gloom and, and not striving per for perfection, like, you know, getting that perfection paralysis of, always wanting to make the right decision, always wanting to make the right choice because there's a million of choices that you yep. have to make throughout the journey. And you recognize that the learning is part of the process and you, you actually are, it's best if you learn on the job. You know, I could have done an MBA and learned about, you know, if you get a business partner, remember to sign this agreement <laughs> and divvy out roles and responsibilities and do all of that. But We've learned that as we've gone by because, you know, we started off and we were, just to give you a funny example, um, Vanessa and I both manage our social media for the Nest hmm. Space. Um, and I had no idea how we were going to split that up. But I recognize that I love the, like, the design of social media, the images. And then when it comes to writing captions, like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I just, I can't be bothered. <laughs> and she loves writing the story behind the post, but she hates finding the images. So we were, we found a good mm. way to divvy out the roles, but then what would happen is I would plan our whole social media feed and I would send her the images and then she just wasn't posting them on time for when I wanted to post them. Um, and so I was getting like a little bit annoyed, a little bit frustrated. And so I just spoke to her and I said, you know, I, I send you all of these images and then you take like, days to post them and then it, it messes up the timing of everything and she said well why don't you just send me the posts that you want to be posted in the week or in two weeks and then I'll know that I have two weeks to post it mm -hmm. and then I'll decide when I post it and when I get inspired but um, it took us going through all of that for us to be like okay so this is the role this is how it's going to work as opposed to getting that in a manual or, you know, in your, in your masters, in your MBA, and then having to put that into practice. So you really need to be okay with having the discomfort, the annoyance, the frustration with your business partner, and to recognize that that doesn't mean it's not working. That's part of the process of you guys figuring out how it is that you, you best work together and what works for one person and works for the other. And maybe talk to me a bit about about that in the sense of running a business, right? So you didn't you didn't um, do a a BCom or you didn't you didn't study in a commercial background. You went medical doctor a year a year in corporate, some time as a kindergarten teacher, and then into running your own business. So a lot of what you've learned from I guess starting a business has been on the job. How have you managed to up upskill yourself? And what, what were some of the, the most daunting things when you got started? Gosh, yeah. I mean, I'm a numbers person. I always enjoyed maths and stuff. So the accounting didn't really freak me out, but it really frustrated me that I couldn't do it all myself. Mm. You know, like that, that I think is something that I've really struggled with is not, I don't have the ability to, you know, to do it, but I simply don't have the time. And if I do everything myself, I probably make some mistakes that only the industry <laughs> experts would know. Um, but I'll also take away time from doing the stuff that I am good at mm. and that only I can do. So upskilling was a huge thing. Um, I did a lot of, of research on like tax, business taxes, um, accounting, because I felt like even if I had a tax consultant and a bookkeeper, I still wanted to know what was going on so that I could keep check of all of those things. Uh, the other thing that was a big thing was um, uh, payroll and staff. 
So again, I'm really good with chatting to people, getting the team together. But then when it came to keeping track of, you know, who's worked when and all of these things, finding the right platform to, you know, manage our payroll, that was all stuff I YouTubed or I asked mm. um, my other friends who are yoga studio owners for help with. So it's, it's, um, it's a weird thing. I, I enjoy it. Like I enjoy upskilling myself and, and learning new things. But there's definitely a frustration in me of not being the expert of everything. Like if I could be an expert in every single part of my business, I would absolutely love to. But you do kind of need to just let go of that and realize that it's it's good. Like you need to understand enough so that you can do the checks and balances. But you definitely need to let go of control a little mm. bit and trust the experts to do what they do best, which I think I'm still learning, you know, like I'm, it's taken me basically the pandemic to get ready to hand over our admin to somebody. It's not easy. Like I have, and I, I know I'm a controller because I have like email responses, exactly how you should respond. If someone's asking <laughs> about a yoga class, this is how you greet them. This is what you say. This is how you sign off the email. So I've been like collating all of these templates. I call them templates, but it's that's not what they are. They're basically me just telling micromanaging whoever it is who's gonna be doing our admin oh, um, that's funny. yeah it's 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 all a lesson right and it, it teaches you some really valuable things about yourself and your own hang-ups as you go through the process and and you mentioned the pandemic uh when you were speaking there maybe uh, talk to us about how how COVID impacted you know the business and and what you've learned or taken away from it yeah that was crazy so i mean to give you an idea of timelines the yoga studio started about August 2018. Mm. Um, and then Vanessa came on board December 2018. And then in 2019, the middle, June, we decided to open up our cafe and our store. And so I would say by September of 2019, we were like in our stride. Me mm. and Vanessa were doing everything. We had a lady who was helping us clean and that was it. So we were both teaching yoga. We were doing stock management of the store. We were buying the groceries for the restaurant, coming up with the recipes, pricing all the food items. Vanessa was cooking them. I was serving them to people. And then, of course, answering emails and doing the admin and paying. So we were doing absolutely everything. And by February 2020, we were in the best place I think our business had ever been. We were so busy, so successful, but Vanessa and I were incredibly burnt out from just having months of doing absolutely everything. So when March came and they announced the pandemic and we all thought it was just going to be 21 days, we were like, oh, okay. We can do it <laughs> 21 days. <laughs> this is what we needed. You know, it's going to be 21 days, basically, you know, like a silent <laughs> retreat, essentially. So we moved all of our yoga classes online. Um, we, the yoga studios were classified as, gym, as gyms at the time. So we, we simply couldn't operate. And we thought we were going to be able to have a bit of a breather for 21 days. And then, of course, it didn't last 21 days. And it went on and on and on and on. And um, we were only really allowed to open level two stage. So that mm. was like more than six months um, into the pandemic. And by that point, we were really struggling. I mean, our landlord didn't give us any concessions on our rent, even though our space was useless to us because we were legally unable to operate. So we ended up getting into, you know, we had to get a mediation process with him and, mm. you know, there were threats of us having to go to court to sort out all the rental issues. But what did end up happening, we got this amazing legal consultant who, I mean, is incredible. I'm terribly bad at negotiating and confrontation. Vanessa is a bit better, but our legal consultant was phenomenal. So he came to an agreement with our landlord um, that we could use the space eventually when we when uh, things opened up. But what we did in the interim was um, I had always, like I said, wanted the, the nest space to be like a school. And so we started doing online yoga teacher trainings where we would train, you know, mainly people of color, actually completely people of color, 
to become yoga teachers. We did that online. And so it was a completely new business, essentially, a completely new revenue stream, different way of doing things. But we ended up developing this training program. And we've now done three of those. Um, I think we have about 50 graduates now, all people sure. of color, all yogis of color. And that's now essentially the backbone of our business. So mm. it was tough. We've now, since then, we ended up opening our space in 2021. Um, but then towards the beginning of 2022, we realized it just didn't make sense. Not a lot of people were coming. The area we were in, Greenside, had kind of become a little bit grungy. It was the party scene. Mm. People were taking shots while we were meditating. It wasn't really <laughs> the best scene. <laughs> so we decided to to actually step away from our physical space and, and take the leap of like trying to find something new that suited us best while just being online with our, our school and our online classes. And so our business has completely changed. It's pivoted. I mean... And in, in a strange way, we are more successful, we're more profitable. Vanessa and I are much less stressed out, much mm. less burnt out. So in terms of our trajectory, it, it, we kind of thought that COVID was going to, you know, be a real slump and, and eventually that we might have to close our doors. But actually, it ended up being the best thing that happened to our business. And it's, it's just helped us become even more successful, which has been amazing. So what, what does the future hold? What, what are the plans for the future uh, coming out of this period and, and almost redefining what the business looks like? Yeah, I think I'm going back to that original vision. Hey, you know, I think we both realized that running a daily cafe is just way too much for us. But mm -hmm. Vanessa loves to cook and food is such an important part of healing. So I think we'll have like a weekend cafe or like, you know, pop up, pop up cafe where people can come on the weekends and and have their meals, but really refine the school aspect of it and go back to being in person and having a physical space. Like I, I'm an extrovert, but I, I really enjoyed lockdown. I know that that's going to be like sacrilege to a lot of people, blasphemy to a lot of people, but like, I loved it. I loved being in, mm. at home and just being in my own space. So there's definitely a bit of like a push and pull between the desire to remain comfortable and just function online and be back in person. But I think we're both feeling like having a physical space, welcoming people in again, teaching in person is really what we want. So our plans are to reopen that, um, open up a couple of um, different branches in Cape Town, Durban. We've got a much wider network now because we've mm. trained 50 yoga teachers of color when we first began and I was trying to find yoga teachers, I struggled because I was looking for only teachers of color, right? And they were like five in Joburg at the time. And now we've trained 50. So we have enough people to open up a Cape Town branch and a Durban branch, maybe even overseas. So yeah, our ambitions are definitely growing, but they've, they've refined at the same time. Mm. Like we know we are not wanting to have a, a daily cafe in each and every one of them, even our store, we're going to narrow down how many products we have. So it's been, it's actually been really good to have the pandemic to redefine and reshape things. But again, a lot of letting go of, you know, attachment to what the business was at that time before lockdown started. And I think that's that really is critical. The ability to to let go and allow the business to change. How do you how, how do you manage that? So I, I think it's it's a case of a lot of businesses, really good businesses, fail because they stick to their guns in terms of what they believe. This is the one ideal that we cannot deviate from, and it has to be there. And it has nothing to do with purpose. It's more a form or a function that you know an owner thinks is really important. And it really isn't. So how have you managed to allow yourself to just move in, in that way? Well, I went on this crazy experience called Survivor, um, <laughs> which <laughs> that's kind of all you do is you adapt, right? You adapt to whatever's thrown at you. And um, yeah, I mean, I, it's funny, but I definitely think that Survivor has helped me to adapt, you know, and, and recognize that, there's so much that's out of your control. Mm. And it's when you try to control everything that actually you get stuck and you get paralyzed in that, like, you know, in that rigidity of security and what you know. 
And what you actually need to do is just constantly keep adapting to whatever it is life throws at you. And so you're totally right. I think your why, your purpose for why you're doing what you're doing should stay the same. But your clientele, the community that you're serving is changing. You know, people's income changed during pandemic. The way people were spending their money changed. Um, what people wanted to spend their money on changed. And so I think when you adapt to the needs of your clientele and to your community, and that obviously means adapting to what life is bringing you, you end up being so much more successful. But at the same time, we adapt as, as human beings, right? I mean, I've changed so much since 2018. And so if my business stayed the same, and I change, there would be friction there because I, I wouldn't be resonating with my business like I did back then. So you have to also allow your business to evolve and grow with you, just mm. like a baby would, right? You don't want your baby to be stuck being a baby the whole time. <laughs> they start crawling, they start walking, they start understanding that they can choose what clothes they want to wear. And, you know, they have their own little personalities. And it's exactly the same thing. It's almost like you, I think the longer your business um, yeah, the longer you have your business, the more and more comfortable you have to be with it becoming its own thing and with mm. you just essentially guiding the way for your business to succeed. And so when you look into the, the future and, and, and with that in mind, what, what excites you the most about what the, the nest base could become? Mm, that's a good question. Surprisingly, I think the most exciting thing is the nest space becoming something that is separate to me. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. I started the business off feeling like I always wanted to have ownership. I always wanted to be teaching, you know, yoga. I always wanted to be in the restaurant greeting our customers. But now it's more become how many people can I bring in so that they can live the life that they want to live? You know, mm. how can I create a working environment where our staff and our managers are able to live the life that I so desperately wanted and have a boss that I could never find, but so desperately needed. So I think that's what really excites me. You know, I, being able to sit at home and just call in and ask, you know, how, how are things going? And knowing that whoever it is that's in charge will know exactly what I know now about how the business works, how it runs, and maybe even give me ideas of how it can be better. Um, so I find that to be really exciting. Um, I never, I've always been an ambitious person. I don't really consider myself to be lazy, but mm. more and more my ambition has been like of letting go of the busyness and letting go of the crazy of like constantly have to be working. So that really excites me. And I think it's because it's going to give me the opportunity to springboard and do other stuff for myself. You know, um, I think a lot of the time as entrepreneurs, you kind of think you have to be an entrepreneur forever um, as long as your business is going. Mm -hmm. But the, the whole thing, it's kind of like being a teacher, right? If you've done your job correctly as a teacher, you become redundant to your students because they know everything that you know. And then they move on to the next teacher. And I think the same is true of being a, a business owner. You want your business to not need you 100%. so that, you know, it can grow and you can grow as well. I mean, I'll use a silly example, but look at look at Microsoft. Is Bill Gates required there now? No, that's exactly. um, th that is the mark of, of, a, of a great business and of a successful founder. I mean, you can you can sit at home and, and enjoy and reap the rewards of your of your past hard work. Yeah, and then you exactly. can find something else and you can create something else. Exactly. Um, Anesu, let's, let's look in at you again. Um, a few more questions um, before, we, before we wrap it up. So over the, the course of, of you starting this business, you've done a lot. Um, what in that journey are you most proud of? So since 2018 to now. Yeah, I mean, it would be remiss for you and I to not talk about Survivor. Um, <laughs> it just wouldn't make sense. It, are you talking about in terms of the business or just what I'm proud of? Uh, you, can, uh, you can provide me an answer for both. Okay, yeah. yeah. In terms of myself, Survivor was a huge thing for me. Like, you know, I grew up watching the show mm. with my dad and I always wanted to do it. Um, and it was kind of like one of those dreams where 
it has the possibility of just remaining a dream forever and mm -hmm. you never really achieving it and being able to go and live out in the wild and survive not so much you know the show aspect of it but the actual experience of it is something i was immensely proud of and something that i i, I cherish it was an, a really incredible experience for me and in terms of the business it's definitely been our teacher training like we spend three months of doing intense, really intense mm. work with our trainers. And the amount of growth that happens with each and every one of them is, is phenomenal. You know, and you're talking about healing things from childhood trauma, generational trauma, mm. like really deep seated work. Um, and the fact that we've helped close to 50 people go through that journey and like been that stepping stone to them fulfilling a dream that I know I had that I that was that has completely changed my life um, has been so special. So definitely those two things and both of them happened in 2020. Mm. Right. Um, so it's it's crazy what the pandemic has brought. It hasn't been easy. But yeah, it's 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 really been a period of time where I've grown and I've, I've achieved things that I hadn't even really thought I would have done in that year, but have become really proud moments for me. No, that's, that's amazing. No, we'd, we'd definitely be remiss to, to, to not speak about Survivor in some capacity. I think it, yeah. uh, as a fan, it's one of the, the, the most exciting things I think we'll ever do. Um, okay. Yeah. Now, now a time travel question. Okay. If, <laughs> if you were somehow to be, to find yourself stood in front of six year old Anesu. Oh yeah. What about the journey that is to come up until this point? Would you tell her to look forward to the most? Mm. I think the moment where I became completely independent. Um, so when I moved from being a preschool teacher to working on the business full time, that was a real highlight for me, a real moment of like, okay, I'm finally in the driver's seat of my life. Like mm. I'm controlling the work that I do, where I'm working, who I'm working with. Um, and, and I think that freedom for me, the, the, like the element of freedom has always been something that I felt like I was searching for, you know, um, even as a child, you know, I would love being outside, feeling free, running barefoot, being in nature. And so having found that freedom through my work and through my career, I think is something that she would be super excited mm. about. And it also just, I think, would make, would make, would help me enjoy the journey a little bit more. You know, like I, I think hindsight is twenty twenty, and everything looks rosy and, and like, you know, joyful when you look <laughs> back at it. But in the process of it, I was stressed out. Like, you know, you're wondering, is this going to work? Am I going to be able to support myself? Where my money going to come from? So if I could just tell her, you know, it's actually, it's all going to work out. Um, so just enjoy, enjoy it because it does have a happy ending. You are going to be okay. Uh, yeah, I think I tell her that. But at the same time, you know, and this is the time traveler's conundrum, telling my six-year-old self that would probably not make her work as hard you know, that, that fear was necessary. So who knows where <laughs> that, that version of me would end up, but it, it probably wouldn't be at this point because I needed the fear and I needed yeah. the stress and the chaos to get me to where I am. No, that's, uh, that is always the conundrum. Do not touch or say <laughs> anything. If you, if you go back in time, no, that's, a, that's, that's a great answer. And it resonates with me quite, quite a bit. Like, I always say the thing that I've enjoyed the most, and I have so many friends like, oh, I hate working. I'm like, I've enjoyed my financial independence more than anything else. Like as a kid, that was all I, I was waiting. And, and we know we have a lot in common. So it's, yeah. it, it, it's, it, it's, 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 it's funny to hear you say that. Cause that's, that's the one thing that I enjoy the most. I mean, I don't have the same level of independence where I'm running my own thing, but that, that would be a dream. That's almost why yeah. I started this podcast. Yeah. Um, Last question. So now you've been on the self-starters podcast, you know what it's about. Whose self-starter journey of someone that you know, do you think would resonate well with, with the audience? 
That's a great question. I'm going to try to think of somebody who's inspired me. There's so many people. Hmm. So I have a friend and I think even like the word self starter is a bit difficult, right? Cause it's like, so when, what is the start? Like, do you have to have a, a business? Does it have to have a name? Does it have to be fully functioning or have you just started on the path of that? But I, I have a friend of mine, um, her name is Lizzie and she has been on a tremendous path of searching. So she's always been um, a lover of film and theater and, you know, kind of everybody has that f- drama friend in high mm. school who's like a little bit kooky, a little <laughs> bit like, what's going on there? But magical in their own right. That's who Lizzie was in high school. And then because of the world and what we're told it can be a profitable career and what can't be, she kind of ended up studying architecture and like what, like land surveillance or whatever it may be. Um, didn't enjoy that at all. So then left, moved to Kenya, did some food writing and, and just, you know, exploring the food scene, then moved again. And now is finally in Stanford doing um, her master's in film and screenwriting mm. and animation. And she's really found her passion. And so she hasn't really, I wouldn't say she's created her end goal yet, but I think for me, her journey of persistence, you know, it's its tough to get to, get to, to kind of reach the start of your journey in your late 20s, early 30s. Mm. And like, that's when you start studying what it is you really wanted to do. And that's what she's done. So I have no doubt, and I'm dropping her name in here because I'm so confident that in a couple of years time, she's going to have her production company, a couple of award-winning films. Like there's no doubt in my mind there. So if you want to catch on early uh, when she's still available, um, that's somebody that 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 came to mind for me. It's a it's a small world. I know Lizzie from UCT. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know Lizzie. Yeah, yeah. She, we we ran we ran in a few of the same circles. Okay, I have no cool. doubt. Yeah. Hearing this, I have no doubt she she'll make a massive success of herself. Yeah, no doubt at all. Yeah, it will be it will be great to hear that story. And yeah. other than that, all I can say is thank you so much for your time. It's uh, so great hearing your story. I must say your courage to to deviate from what is every, I think, parent of color's dream, which is to have a child who's a doctor, is is admirable. Um, and, and to see the success that you've built of yourself is, is very inspiring. And, you know, it, it just goes to show that if, if, you, if you know what you want to do, you, you really can achieve it and, and you can enjoy yourself whilst doing it. So thank you so much, my friend. I really appreciate your time. 